Once you've re-landed on Castia's unfrozen surface, talk to the little dwarf in front of your landing spot, and he can fix your ship for you to go to the Fire Planet Raisin. However, you need a special item called the Aquarium, so make your way over to Fort Piscato, and you're unable to use any warp points, so you have to manually walk there. If you want, you can use Celestial Swap to change the planets in your favor when you attempt the next boss fight coming up. Just power up everything, except for making it nighttime. When you reach the port, you're blocked by two Space Police troops. However, the officer who works here normally, Detective Bangnet, lets you in with some persuading and enter the house in the top right of the area to talk to Bangnet to access the far left of the town. He'll distract the troops for you so you can sneak by. Though, you can refill your inventory and leave the end to change the time of day. It's hard to always change the time of day instead of night. I'll explain in a minute. Sneak to the left there to access the Nata de Coco door, where you see three pirate otters trying to slice open some seaweed. But unfortunately, Master Char makes his second grand entrance, and he wants to fight you for a second time. And this time, he is not alone. The second shard fight isn't too bad this time around, though you still have to be cautious of some aspects of the fight. The big difference is around his shard and his loyal pirate otter minion to stop you in your tracks. These guys have the same stats and movesets when you fought them on Gren, so they only have two attacks, weak slash and leaping slash. These otters are relatively fast, so taking them out should be your first priority. These otters can drop your defenses and when shard attacks from the back and stack some damage over time. The otters aren't that bad to take out, if you power up the earth planet, then Mocha can easily take out one in the front, or drastically weaken them in a lot in the back. Since Laxies are fast in your party, she should use Wind Tower to chip away at some health, and same goes for Chai. Or for Chai, you can also use Minty Breath Protect and boost your defenses in battle. Similarly with the protagonist, if you're light, I suggest Crystal Lasering Shard, which will do a lot. Or if you're dark, Shadow Dive one of the otters to clean up. As for Pico, he should always use Afterburner or Lava Spuds on Shard, considering the otters resist fire attacks, and Pico can do a lot of damage. After you take out all three, you just have to worry about Shard himself. He won't call for backup like the Ant Queen, so you're safe to go all out. As for Shard himself, he can do four things in battle. His main four attack is using Shadow Die to constantly break the pain. This is why I highly recommend you start the fight in the daytime to prevent max damage on Shadow Die. Especially if you're a light, which stacks up with the otter damage from earlier, can be an easy KO for you. This fight can last quite a while, so it'll most probably change the night eventually. Shark second and only other attack is using his classic finger point trick, and this time he'll point to a character of choice. After the turn goes over to him again, he use Sky High Kick, which can do a lot to one player and slightly damage the others. Use a classic strategy with blocking and you'll be safe. Charge's last option is using Celestial Swap, but his main strategy is to align the planets to unleash a devastating attack. Either counter this with your own Celestial Swap to change the planets to power you up, or if the planets are close to you to change, you can unleash that own magic attack yourself. Lassie won't be too useful from here on out, so you can use things like gummy worms, frogs, ice cubes, or even jams to aid you in the fight. After a couple dozen turns of constantly barraging shard with magic, the fight should be over. And you should see the Sage Band, which will give you more experience after battle. Once the fight is done, the Space Leaf carried off shard, and the Pirate Otters try to run. With the giant seaweed wall in front of you, do what's best and use Pico to burn everything to the ground, revealing a new entrance. After a short walk inside, you'll find another roadblock, but you can't burn it or move it. So you can destroy it using Chai's magic to sprout the seed on top to break the rock in two. After all that, the special Aquarino should be yours to take you. However, the regular otters are a little upset and they don't want you to take the Aquarino. Thankfully, it only takes the persuasion of a single female otter to change the minds of the male otters. Meanwhile, the space police are working with the pirates and charred if that wasn't obvious. So once you're done with the cutscene, the warp back to the dwarf and show up the Aquero to power up your ship to raise it. And have a very serious talk about Sorbet's financial situation. And finally, head off to raise it. Ha! Huh. Well, that was very short. I don't want to talk about Raisin just yet because there's so much to that one planet, so I thought it'd be a good idea to talk about some stuff I missed in all the previous parts. Mainly a few topics I alluded to before but never got a chance to talk about. So let's start off with the three character bios I missed in the first episode, being Lassie, the light protagonist, and the dark protagonist. 
So to start off with the Wind Mage, Lassie, she is probably your most useful character in the Frog Party, while simultaneously not being entirely useful. Her main trait is healing your team using moves like Healing Link and later down the line, Mother's Nest. She is also really fast, probably the fastest until Chai joins your party later on, which means there's many opportunities to heal the team, meaning that she's basically only useful in the back row. Except like in the beginning of the game, where having her own front, Earthway is very useful. And thanks to her high MP count, she can gain MP faster than all the other characters. Though she does have a big weakness. Her bulk. She ain't thick, unfortunately, and later on she's very weak in terms of HP and defenses. You're basically screwed if you face against a wood pitch, due to being nearly one-shotted by them. And again, if you have a better party members, you're basically useless in the front row. Or in this case, a bunny in the sight of its predator. Next up we have the Light Mage, and as I said before on the channel, it's probably the most average mage on the journey, having a lot of techniques but never mastering any of them. So the best thing about the Light Mage is that you have access to several heavy hitting attacks like Crystal Laser, a healing move in Healing Light, and a barrier move in Prism Barrier, which can block off all forms of attacks until the barrier breaks. This also means the mage can be good in both moves, doing lots of damage in the front with both bosses being Dark Mages, and Crystal Laser and Arc Light doing a lot of damage. Or you can be good in the back with healing the team with healing light or guarding with Prism Barrier. Though that's where the weaknesses show, the lack of anything overly powerful. The Light Mage takes the longest time to get all the magic, which getting last move takes until above level 50. And another thing is to take notes, the enemies will have a special directly targeting you for the protagonist. This also applies to Dark as well, so most of the time you're healing yourself because all the enemies are targeting you. But still, Light is still pretty dang good. And now onto the Dark Mage, and the Dark Mage is definitely a lot more powerful compared to the rest of the team, having four different attacks with stuff like Shadow Die doing your standard damage, Blood Money healing you afterward, and Dazzle Darts inflicting stat drops on the opponent. Also has some really good stats overall. But that's where the positive is at. The start is definitely the hard mode of your journey. No quick access to recovery or defenses. So your only staff buffing move is Jackpot, being a random set of staff buffs that you can't control. And the Dark Mage is basically only useful in the front row. And yes, he can do quite a lot of damage, but the back row, the Dark Mage is inconsistent. Dark can only hit three opponents at random, and maybe good stuff with like Dazzle Darts or maybe Blood Money. But for most of the early game, you're stuck with Shadow Die and Jackpot. Two very underwhelming moves compared to the rest of the team. Not to mention, Light and Dark don't get any good equipment until the post game. But yeah, Dark is difficult to use, but to give a bit of a comparison, Dark Mage is simply just like Dragon types in Pokemon. Very weak in the early stages, but extremely strong late game. Next, I want to talk about some secrets I talked about in the Buffoon episode and the Gren episodes. The secret chest. These chests spawn on the overworld when the planet you're on is powered up on the star map. These chests are scattered and contain some special items. The only reason I bring them up now is that you didn't really have a consistent access with these chests due to not having celestial swap. But now that you do, you can easily switch the plans on a weakened opponent, then run away to spawn the chest. I'll talk about the ones I miss, but I'll start with incorporating the special chests once the plan is fully done. So starting with Cassia, the only secret chest you can find right now is below the entrance of the port, where it contains 140 Mira. Next on Earth, the Earth planet, the first secret chest is in the land where the stars sleep, in the area with the two turnips and the brownie. This contains a Pony Peak. And the second secret chest is the area right before you crash landed, where you contain 250 Mira. Finally, on Buffoon, both chests are found in the southern exit of Mana Rikashi, where the first secret chest to the far left contains a Putty P, and the second chest to the south there contains 750 Mira. Once again, Gren doesn't have any secret chests, so you don't have to go through the Carbonara Jungle Labyrinth again. And again, I'll explain the Putty P's split later on. Just know it's for 100%. Speaking of 100%, there's something that I kind of intentionally skipped out on talking about being the true 100% category. Now what do I mean by true 100%? Well, that means basically collecting everything in the game, being stuff like beast area trees, all the items, and specifically, no gummy frogs, which is a very difficult feat to do. Not impossible, but very difficult. 
Considering the strong enemies and bosses you have to face, leading through the playthrough is being more grindy than anything, and that's less about tactics and strategies. This tutorial series is meant for a more casual audience, who wants a simple way to pick up the game for the first time and don't want to be overwhelmed by so much. I'm doing my best to find every enemy in the single player game, but I'm unable to locate any of the beast area entries that requires multiplayer Amigo Dungeon. Plus, it's hard to showcase any enemies because the sites I use for research don't have a clear image of the recolored enemy. I know the foes exist in the files, but I don't know how to properly dig through said files and dump them onto a website. And finally, yes, there are more party members than the six I mentioned. There are eight characters, seven special party members that can be switched out for these new guys. However, they're not like normal party members. They have a special ability that no other party member can access, including new field members. However, there is a really, really big catch. They don't level up in a traditional way like winning battles or giving beat pops to them. They only level up via linking to other copies of Star Summon. If you want all of them optimally, you're going to have to make three new files of one copy of Star Sign, use that one completed file on another copy of Star Sign, reset those three files on the first copy, then rinse the repeat until all the rewards are claimed. Here is a list of all the special items that you obtain from connecting to all the other files. Sorry I can't showcase footage of getting these, but this would cost a lot of money just to get the footage I need. Like I need a DS capture card, another DS, another copy of Star Sign, and some knowledge about how all this stuff works. As for all the Amigo dungeons, I don't have any way to showcase it or the special figurines that Macadamias can make. But if there's any way to showcase stuff without breaking my bank account, please share it with me. But don't worry, I'll still make a bio for every egg character just for you guys. And maybe one day we'll get footage of Amigo dungeon and a pretty well documented showcase of multiplayer. This community just needs to grow and grow until we get it all done. Um, okay, so hey guys, uh, this is uh, Future Danger Boat here. So I am recording this right after, like I'm about to upload this video, but then I found this video uploaded uh, by Yoppy underscore Chan, and it's about the, um, the Macadamia figurine fights that he only obtained in the post-game Mego Dungeons. So like, there's a couple one that showcases like, like over here we have like a dark Puka character. Uh, over here we have um, like Mud Flap or Stench Lord, I believe. We have this cool looking recolor of Avalon. Uh, level 78. It shows stats up here, but uh, if you want me to talk about them, I will. But not only that, it also showcases all the Eggy characters as well. And I forgot to mention this beforehand, but the reason to get to the last Egg character is getting the obtaining, not using zero gummy worms, or gummy frogs, excuse me, and then talking to one of the end game characters. So that's how you obtain the character. That's how, the, the, I'm gonna link this video in the description if you wanna check it out. I might post more information about it later on, but yeah, I just wanted to bring this up for the video uploads. All right, uh, back to you, if you, back to you, past danger boat. Sorry for this last section to be a little ranty, but I just needed to clear some things up. But next time we enter the land of Raisin, probably the hardest planet in the beginning part of the game, 